In all you're getting, get wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. Through wisdom is a house built. And by understanding, it is established. Join Apostle Joshua Selman of Eternity Network International as he takes you on a journey into the wisdom of God's Word. It's intimacy. It's partnership. It's fellowship. This is Koinonia. One more time, inside, outside, online. Can you celebrate our Father? Just have a to Joshua Kelman. Amen. Hallelujah. Please help me greet someone and take your seat very briefly. Amen. It's a great privilege to stand here tonight to bring the word of the Lord. Our Father, the Apostle, is in Abiyo Kuta, Lagos, Aziz, and yesterday, blessing the body of Christ, and he has asked me to send his love to us. Can we just say, Apostle, we love you? He's not here in person right now, but his spirit is right with us. I guarantee you he heard what he just said. Amen. We love you so much. It's easier for us to celebrate him so much when he's not around. He's around. He caught so many things. So since he's not around, let's enjoy it. Isn't it? Amen. The hallmark of a true apostolic ministry is not just the ability to produce results in the lives of people. It's not just the ability to reveal a dimension of God to a generation an apostolic ministry's responsibility goes beyond that a scripture that our father read last week, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, it said ye also as lively stones are being built up into a spiritual house you also in verse 4 it talks about Christ being the cornerstone and then in verse 5, he said, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. That means that the destination of everything that the Holy Spirit is doing through different vessels and ministries is that a single edifice called a spiritual house becomes the result. So Paul said, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And he said, another will build on this foundation and he said let every man be careful how he builds 
So an apostolic ministry is not just one that has experience of the dimensions of God, has had encounters and can bring the body to those experiences, but one who is like an architect that is building the body in accordance with the requisite proportions of the different components so that that edifice can be produced and will fit the description in Revelation 21 that the building is a perfect square. The length, the height, the width are equal. And we are privileged by grace and election to be part of a ministry that is consciously and consistently doing this. Not exaggerating what aspect of the body of Christ or the kingdom are both another so that we will not have a lopsided group. Amen. In this place we have been taught principles. We have been taught the systems of God. We have been taught the things that are responsible for producing realities in the lives of men in this kingdom. Amen. Apostle taught us expressly in this place, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. He said, according as his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He told us expressly how that there are things that pertain to life and there are things that pertain to godliness. That if you embrace the things that pertain to life and forsake the things that pertain to godliness, there are dimensions you will never experience and your growth process will not be complete. But there are others who will embrace the things that pertain to godliness and throw away the things that pertain to life. In the same way, you will also not have a balanced experience in your Christian work. So it is expected that you gain understanding of the things that can bring you into the fullness of the things that pertain to life and the things that pertain to godliness. And Peter didn't leave us in the dark. He said these things are assessed. They are accessed through the knowledge of him who has called us unto glory and virtue. The knowledge is the key. The key is knowledge. Knowledge of what? We have been taught week in, week out here the things that we are supposed to know. But I summarize into three the things I believe that a Christian should know, the knowledge I believe a Christian should have to have a balanced experience in his growth process in the kingdom. Number one, the first knowledge has to be the knowledge of God. It's not necessarily the knowledge of principles first and foremost. The person of God, the person of his son, Jesus Christ, the saving knowledge of Jesus. You need to understand who God is, the multifaceted dimension of his oppression and the different possibilities that those dimensions can bring. Amen. There is the dimension of God as a father. What the dimension of God as a father produces is not the same as what the dimension of God as a king produces. So, you need to know God in his different offices and his different dealings with man. You need to understand that God is all-powerful. You need to understand that God is loving and is always willing to do you good. You need to understand that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from God the Father of light, in whom there is no variableness, neither is there shadow of turning. That means that if I say something that is not good, I can categorically say that this is not from God because I know the things that can come from God. Amen. So I know what God is always doing. He is always willing to do good. He is able to do good. He is eager to do me good. And he has everything that is needed to produce all the results and the possibilities that I desire in my life. You need to know God. You need to know that he is not one that won a competition among many gods. You need to know that his throne is not threatened. When you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there is never a time that any man saw a revelation of heaven and saw God standing. Every time the man saw God, God was sitting. Kings sit when there is rest. So there has never been a situation that warranted God being in an emergency standing mode. The only time we saw him stand was when Jesus stood to receive Stephen. It was not because there was an emergency that he needed something to be done quickly to produce results. You need to understand that God is not scratching his head, thinking of what to do with the earth. You need to know that God is not worrying, hey, what is Satan is doing? So the first knowledge you should have is about God, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his omniscience, all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present, able, willing, and eager to step into your mind. 
But after the knowledge of God, the knowledge of God in itself may not necessarily produce your results. Because yes, you have understood the principles. There is another thing that the knowledge of God is supposed to produce. He said, who do men say that I am? And then after saying so many things, Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father. That means it is not given to a man to know what God is and who God is until God by himself reveals that thing to that man. He said, this is not revealed to you by flesh and blood. And I tell you the intent of this revelation. I say unto you, because you recognize me as the Christ, the Son of the living God, I say unto you, you are Peter. And upon this revelation of who you are, I will build my church. I cannot build my church upon your knowledge of me. Your knowledge of me should produce something about you that will be a foundation upon which I should build something. Your life is built on what you have discovered as your place in Christ. You need to understand our oneness with Him. You need to understand our positional advantage with Him. Your knowledge of God must translate into a knowledge of you in God. That's number two. Amen. And then after that, there is a third person you must know. There is a third person that you must know. His name is Satan. I'm not trying to postulate uh, a theory that we should start studying Satan. No. There are certain things you must know about Satan to remain victorious. Number one, the consequence of the cross upon him. We know what the cross did for us. We know what the cross purchased for us. The cross did not only affect us. It's not just that he delivered us from the hands of Satan. There is something the cross did to Satan. <laughs> when Satan hears the blood of Jesus, what comes to his mind? What does he think when you mention the name of Jesus? What is it did you have on him? What is Satan's current position relative to me? Where is Satan relative to me? If I'm addressing Satan, should I look up or down? Where is he? It's important you know where Satan is related to you. But a second thing that you need to know about Satan is his strategies. Say strategies. Strategies. How many of you have ever wondered? The Bible has said so many things about what Jesus accomplished, where we are in Christ. We are a new creature. All things are passed away. Yet demons come to press you. Yet you know that what is happening to you is not process. It is entirely an activity of demonic forces. You are born again genuinely. You pray in tongues, anointed and even doing ministry. Has it ever been a concern to anybody? It has been a concern to me for a long time. And I wonder if... All powers belong to Jesus. Jesus said, all powers in heaven, on earth, beneath the earth, has been given to me. I think Satan should belong to one of these three realms. If he belongs to one of these three realms, that means whichever realm he belongs to, the power that he's working with should have been given to Jesus. How come Satan is still buffeting the lives of people? What power is he using? And I realized that Satan is not necessarily using a power that is superior to what Jesus did. Satan is only strong to the degree that he can make his strategy secret. The strength of Satan is his ability to hide in darkness. If his strategies are known, they become powerless. They become powerless. They become powerless. The Bible never instructed us to put on the whole armor of God to fight against the powers of Satan. He said to fight against the deceit, the wiles. That means the ability of Satan to deceive you is his greatest advantage. Second Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, Paul speaking. He said, let he get advantage of us. Let not be ignorant of his devices. The word get, get me disturbed most times. The Bible didn't say let it take advantage of us. He said let he get. That means if Satan succeeds in making you ignorant, the advantage is in his hand. It's not that he's trying to get it. 
If the only thing that Satan needs to do for the advantage over your life as a Christian to be in his hand is that he deceives you to be ignorant of his devices. Satan is not so powerful. Can you give us Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 if you can have it in the Living Bible? We're very glad. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11. He said, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles. The word wiles there means deceit. Deceit, hidden strategies. Of who? The devil. Next verse. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Living Bible says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand safe against all strategies and tricks of Satan. For we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against persons without bodies, the evil rulers of the unseen world, those mighty satanic beings, and great evil princes of darkness who rule this world and against huge numbers of wicked spirits in the spirit world. Men without bodies. People without bodies. He said we should so that we can stand against the strategy and the tricks of Satan. A believer who does not understand how Satan operates will be treated by Satan and be defeated by Satan. Because what Satan is touching is not exactly where his interest is. It's a distraction. Because if you find out what he is doing, you will stop him. He knows that you have the power. The least of the saints can stop Satan. Yes. But his ability to shield himself in darkness becomes the advantage he has over believers. And Paul tells us all things are made manifest by the light. By the light. So we thank God in this place, God has been giving us spiritual intelligence so that we are not ignorant of the things that Satan is doing. So that we can understand where Satan is coming from. What gives him the ground on which he does certain things and be able to apply the principles of the kingdom to stop him. Hallelujah. It is on this note tonight I have the mandate of our Father to teach on altars and foundations tonight. Altars and foundations. Hmm. I trust God that will be so mightily blessed. Before we take definitions of what altar is, let's read a scripture that has blessed me and has made me think in a different way about God. Isaiah chapter 33 verse 22 I used to wonder why I go through trouble and God does not step in no matter how much I cry for the Lord is our judge the Lord is our lawgiver the Lord is our king he will save us the Lord is our judge the Lord is our lawgiver the Lord is our king. This is where the Americans got their concept of executive, legislative, and judiciary for. Amen. He said he shall save us. He will save us. The question is this. If he is going to save us, he is going to save us based on any of these three dimensions that is relevant for the bondage. It is not every time that he saves us king. It's not every time that he saves as judge. It's not every time that he saves as the lawgiver. When the matter needs to be decided by a judge and you are praying to the Lord our King, he hears your prayer, but that office does not carry the configuration to bring the result that you are looking for. Because a judge does not veto a case. A judge decides a case by looking at the written code. Amen. Your ability to present your case, your ability to defend your side of your whatever that you are looking for, your ability to quote the precedence of the judicial process before the judge 
is what the judge will look at and will say that based on the evidence is available before me, I give, I give you what they call the justice, isn't it? But the king does not need the judicial process. The Bible says where the word of a king is, there is power. So you need to understand which dimension of God is responsible for producing the result. At the time that Isaiah wrote this, the, the, the world or the nation of Israel had not gotten the revelation of God as a father. It was when Jesus was born that God was revealed as a father. So that adds one to this number. So the Lord is our father. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. Amen. But the undoing of the body of Christ is that we are so much aware of God as a father that every time we approach him we are looking unto the father to give us justice the father does not give justice it is the judge that gives justice the judge is the father I watched a home video from years ago silent night and from the time God began to teach me things, it was that video he started using. A man was a judge. His son was involved in armed robbery. And they were arrested and brought before him as the judge. The wife was begging him, save her son. But his hands are tied. There were evidences before him that pointed to the fact that this boy is a criminal and deserves to die. The heart of the father wanted to save him. The office of the judge prevented him. And a father sentenced his own son to death by firing squad. Listen to me. In this race that we are in, when it has to do with the matters of Satan, if you only know God as a father, you will be limited. You will be limited. You will be limited. I pray you will understand the mysteries I'm bringing before you tonight. That you will walk out of predicaments, things that have held you bound for a long time as if they never happened. God never left us without an option. He is my father. He loves me. I don't doubt his love, but I know there is a limit to what his father can do. Ah, there's a limit. There's a limit. There's a limit. What did Job do to God? What did he do to God? Why could do, Is God not all powerful again? Is he not the almighty? Is Satan not uh, a creator that he created? Why couldn't he veto the demands of Satan? Why did he grant the demands of Satan? What exactly did Satan do that God couldn't say? God was the one that testified about a man. Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him in all the earth? He has chewed evil and feared the Lord. Can God give a testimony about a man that is false? And Satan said, I know that what you said about Job is true, but there is another thing I see. I am approaching the court, and there is a cross-examination I want to do, and God was helpless. Do you think it was the desire of God for Job to go through what he went through? Why couldn't he stop Satan? What makes you think he will stop Satan? <laughs> what makes you think he will stop Satan? God created man in a very unique way. Let's do a little of history. God created man in a very unique way. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Now God, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion, isn't it? Over all the things that we created. Over the birds of the air, over the fishes of the sea, over the things that creep upon the earth, over all the earth, isn't it? So, and verse 27, God made man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Verse 28, and God blessed them. God empowered them to succeed. And God said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Subdue it, have dominion. Amen. And then the Bible went on and told us how that God finished all he created. And in chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible began to give another account of the creation of man again. 
The Bible says that God formed man out of the dust of the earth. It used to bother me for a long time until the Holy Spirit started giving me understanding that in chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says He created man in His image. God is a spirit and they that must worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So if God made man in His image, that means God made man a spirit. Amen. And a spirit cannot function on earth without having a body. Man cannot adapt to the regions of the earth without being made from the materials from the earth realm where he's supposed to rule. So God made a body for the man. The body is not the man. He made the body for the man. The same thing he did with Jesus. A body has thou prepared me to do your will, O oh God. The will is to be done on earth and to be done on earth the spirit must have a body. And then God made the body of man and the Bible says that God breathed into the nostrils of that man and that man became a living soul. That means a soul compartment was given to the man. So man became the only creature that has his unique configuration. He is a spirit and he's also physical. So he can be in the realm of the spirit and the realm of the earth at the same time. Not even God could do that. Uniquely designed. So man had advantage of the realm of the spirit. He had advantage of the realm of the earth. And the soul given to the man became the intermediary that interpret the impulses of the spirit for the body to execute. Because the dominion has to be communicated in a language understood by the earth. The language spoken by the spirit cannot be understood by the earth. So the soul becomes the intermediary that receives these impulses and interprets it in a language that the earth can work with. So it was the unique design of man. And God tested his creation to see how effective this creation is. And the Bible says that God brought all the animals to man to see what he will name them. And the Bible says, whatsoever name Adam called it, he didn't say that became the name. He said that was. That means the animals were named before they were brought to Adam. But the information about the names were not revealed to Adam. Adam without consulting God. Ayah. So Adam didn't have to say, God, what should I call this? It was Adam's decision to call lion, lion. And God said, I named this lion before I brought it to you. See the level of intelligence that man operated in until tragedy struck and then man fell and man began to do guesswork the Bible says that they made aprons of fig leaves and covered themselves and when God came he made a coat of animal skin imagine the difference in, in sophistication fig leaves and coat apron and coat Man suddenly lost that intelligence because the, 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 the God nature in him that made him reason like God had left. So from that time there was a desire in the heart of a mortal man to access the realm of the spirit because he knows that there is a possibility beyond his human existence. So from that time as man was searching, they began to intercourse with all manner of wisdoms, all manner of spirits, and began to enter into certain covenants with them. Because the spirit cannot access the earth without an authorization by a man. Amen. And the man is now limited because of his fall. So there was a partnership between man and this spirit. So that man can grant them authorization to come to the earth. And these authorizations were made by what we call altars. So access points were created by men in an attempt to access the realm of the spirit. Interestingly, it is not only the Holy Spirit that can grant a man access to the possibilities in the realm of the spirit. The spirit of dead men can do that. The spirit of animals can do it if there is something like that. That's why some people worship all kinds of animals. Amen. So because the Holy Spirit is not the only spirit that can activate spiritual realities in the life of men. So men who are not willing because the process of, of accessing the wisdom that the Holy Spirit brings requires that the man die first. Requires that the man die. 
Because when God chased Adam out of the garden, the Bible says that he placed at the entrance of the garden cherubims and and what? A flaming sword. I used to think that he placed cherubims carrying a flaming sword. No. He placed cherubims and a flaming sword. If you read your Bible very well, the psalmist tells us that where the cherubims are, that is where the throne of God is. When you see the similitude of what he told Moses to build above the Ark of the Covenant, between the mercy seat, where there are two cherubims that are covering it, he said between them at the throne of God, he said, I will commune with you from above that point. So the presence of the cherubim at the entrance to the garden means that God took his throne and placed it at the entrance of the garden. And it's not just his throne he brought there. The Bible says a flaming sword. And the Bible tells us that the word of the Lord is quick, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing unto the dividing and thunder of soul and spirit. So that means the flaming sword himself is Jesus Christ. Such that nobody can access the tree of life without first encountering the sword. And when you meet the sword, the sword must divide and thunder. You can't go there and eat it as you ask. So men not willing to go through this process began to boycott and began to look for other spirits that can grant them access to these possibilities. That can grant them access to these possibilities. This was the origin of witchcraft. We saw it in Genesis chapter 6. How that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, the fallen angels, saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they began to take wives, they began to interact. They began to intercourse with the daughters of men. And the Bible says that sons were born unto this fallen spirit. The origin of the Nephilim. Amen. And then we saw that certain witchcraft divinations were activated upon the face of the earth. And evil began to increase. And the Bible came in the days of Noah that God saw that Noah and his sons were perfect. The word perfect means they were the only pure humans. Amen. Not that they were sinless. They were the only pure human. Every other person had interacted with the fallen spirit. And as a result of that, had, had their DNA compromised. They were no longer pure human. And then God decided to destroy these people. But something happened very interesting. He destroyed the people and preserved Noah and his three sons their wives and his wife, isn't it? That means that the only people that were preserved were the people that were pure, right? So where did evil come back from into the earth? All the men that were evil were destroyed. But evil was still sustained. What exactly happened? We'll come back there in a few minutes. Before I get excited, what is an altar? Apostle has given us several definitions, altar of prayer. A lot of definitions have been given to us. And I'm not going to go over those once again. I will just add one or two definitions to it that will help me buttress the things I'm bringing tonight. You can write. <laughs> an altar is a gateway. An altar is a gateway between the realm of the spirit and the earth realm. An altar is a gateway between the realm of the spirit and the earth realm that grants unhindered access. That grants unhindered access to certain spirit beings. To find legal expression in the earth. An altar is a gateway between the realm of the spirit and the earth realm that grants unhindered access to certain spirits, spirit beings, to find legal expressions in the earth. Secondly, an altar is a legal landing pad of spirit on the earth. An airplane has an airport where it lands, isn't it? There's a landing tarmac, isn't it? Um, an altar is the landing spot, legal landing spot for 
demons for spirits, any kind of spirit, not necessarily demons. Amen. Are we together? Jesus, help us tonight. An altar is an altar because of the presence of sacrifice. Right. An altar is an altar because of the presence of sacrifice. I just told us now that the realm of the spirit wants to interact with the realm of the earth legally, right? And the earth wants to interact with the realm of the spirit because the inhabitants of the earth know that without the realm of the spirit they are limited in the possibilities that they can produce. So they call for the assistance of the spirit beings. Listen very carefully. So, in agreement to bring these possibilities to the inhabitants of the earth, the spirits give their conditions. Certain things that can be done that can create a habitation that will look exactly like where they are coming from. And then they summarize their demands in what they call sacrifice. And they ask men to raise certain structures and put certain sacrifices. So the sacrifice, the kind of sacrifice upon the altar is dependent on the kind of spirit that wants to access the earth. So the absence of a sacrifice upon an altar makes it not to be qualified to be called an altar. That's just stone or anything that is made. So the sacrifice is what makes it an altar. And the kind of sacrifice that is placed upon the altar is determined by the kind of spirit that man wants to interact with. Amen. And the kind of spirit to whom the altar is raised determines whether the altar will be a good one or a bad one. So if it is raised unto God, remember that the Bible says that we should present our bodies as living sacrifice. That means the minimum requirement to make the Holy Spirit come to the earth to assist you is that your body, not an animal, not your money, your body is the minimum requirement that you can give to the Holy Spirit. So in the same way, different demon spirits have their demands as to the things that qualify to bring them to the earth. Some of the sacrifices are not necessarily animals. They can just be setting abstinence from some things. I remember some years ago when I was in secondary school, we had a cook then. And for 30 days, she, left, she didn't have her bath. Imagine a woman who has not, water has not touched her body for 30 days. And then we discovered that she was cooking for us and we're eating. We discovered that this woman, there were some aroma that were coming that is not from the food. And we started to ask. She said, no, that their deity said that she should not have her bath for a period of time. That is a sacrifice. It's not an animal. But if she's able to do that completely, there is a possibility that that experience itself will activate. So over time, we see that families and territories have activated altars, some unto God, others unto some spirit that gave them momentary results for a while and then suddenly begin to take some uh, things from them. Let me say this very quickly. There is no spirit that assists man without getting anything in return. No spirit, including the Holy Spirit, will not assist you without getting something in return. For the Holy Spirit, what he gets in return is you. And every one of these spirits, their allegiance with you is not just because of your commitment to them. It's because of the territories of the earth that is within your jurisdiction that you will bring under their control. So, it might just be me, a single young brother that is trying to make ends meet, that evokes a spirit and enter the covenant. I thought that I did it alone, but the spirit is seeing my children. The spirit is seeing my children's children. The spirit is seeing four and five generations from me. He knows that it is just me, but if he can get me to enter this agreement, he knows how many people that he's going to get. So many people are under influences of covenants that were entered generations for many years before they were born. They find themselves as, as Christians but are being driven by possibilities they cannot explain. 
Because certain things were done. Look at the life of Abraham, for example. The Bible says that when God told Abraham to leave his father's house and go to the land of Canaan, when he came to the land of Canaan in verse 7, when God spoke with him, he raised an altar. Verse 8, he raised another altar. And then the Bible says that Abraham pitched his tent between Bethel, where he raised the altar, and Ai. Amen. And then he left that place and went to Egypt. And from Egypt, he came back and stayed in the same place where he raised his altar. And then Abraham left the scene. Isaac came on board. And one day, his grandson Jacob was on his way going to Haran, to his uncle's house. And then the night fell and he decided to sleep. He was not trying to pray. He was not trying to seek God. And it happened by divine orchestration that he found himself lying down at the same spot where Abraham had raised an altar unto God. And suddenly the Bible says that he had a dream and he saw a ladder ascending from the earth to the heaven. Angels ascending and descending. That, that portal did not happen the day Jacob came there. From the day Abraham raised that altar, that gate was opened. From that day, angels were ascending and descending. And then the career of the covenant that Abraham enacted upon that altar came. Many people passed through that place. Listen, listen very carefully. Many people passed through that place. Probably slept in that place. They didn't see that portal. Because when the covenant was entered, it was entered between Abraham and his seed. So, you can come to that place and lie down and not see anything. But if you are a seed of Abraham, you must see. So, the moment Jacob came to that place and he laid down, suddenly the heavens were opened and there was Yahweh standing. He said, I had a deal with Abraham in this place. And there, is certain, there are certain things that we agreed upon. One of those things is that the land on which you lay, I will give it to you. Imagine if Abraham raised that altar onto a demon spirit. Jacob will come there and still interact with the spirit. Because it was between Abraham and his seed. Now, Jacob came to that place and had the experience. And then he stood up from that place and went to the house of Laban. Labored for Rachel for seven years. Labored for, uh, labored for Leah for seven years. Labored for Rachel for another seven years. And then worked for Laban for another seven years. Amen. And as he was laboring there in chapter 35, ah, Jacob was dwelling around where Shechem and his brothers were. And because he understood that there was something about raising altars unto God. He raised an altar in that place and God said, no, there is another altar that has been raised on your behalf. You don't have to raise another one. My deal is with you. It's based on the altar at Bethel. And God said, rise up and go to Bethel. Because I am. And then Jacob left with his family. They came to Bethel. He activated that altar again and he called it El Bethel. Amen. And then, many years later, Israel came out of Egypt. Israel came out of Egypt. They crossed the Jordan. They brought down Jericho. And they wanted to fight a little city called Ai. And then a man called Achan had taken off their costume. And they couldn't defeat Ai. And um, Joshua went to God and cried, what happened? And God said, some Israel had sinned. And they began to cast lots and they came to a point that they discovered, okay, this is the person that did it. They cleansed the nation of that guilt and they were to go to war. And God gave them a strategy. The Bible said that they went to lay ambush at a particular spot. And the spot where they laid the ambush was between Bethel and Ai. The same place Abraham dwelt. They never decided to go there. But there was a force from the altar that is saying that this land was given to Abraham and his seed. If you must take the land, you must align with the altar that Abraham had built. And it was from that place they began to defeat all the nations. Listen to me, altars are transgenerational in their operation. They never die out with the person that erected it. Transgenerational. 
And it's amazing that many of us, if not all of us, are under the influence of one or more of these altars. Does it mean that the death of Jesus was in vain? No. But there is something, there is an intelligence in motor. You don't just get delivered from an altar by saying, I don't want. No. That's not how marriage is broken. A wife does not tell the husband, I'm not doing again. The marriage is still valid even if she's in her father's house. <laughs> because there is a legal process that brought the marriage. So there is a legal process that will break the marriage. You don't wish your way out of the influence of an altar. You don't. Brothers and sisters, I'm particularly interested about the negative altars. And these negative altars have formed the foundation upon which our lives have been built. The reason behind the predicament, the reason behind some of the sicknesses that we have, the reason behind some of the troubles that we see in our lives, the reason behind many of the failures that we see, there are altars that speak. And do you know that these negative altars, their effect becomes stronger by the next generation. They become more destructive by the next generation. So you will be a wicked person not to pay attention to the altars that are around the family and the places where you come from. It is the peak of wickedness in my opinion, especially if you are a brother. Especially if you are a brother. Altars are real. Altars will stop you if you allow them. Altars are real. And our daddy told us when he was teaching us on dominion over causes that it is the integrity of God that supervises the operation of this world. Remember, the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. Altars are real. There are many ways that altars affect us. But I will just talk about only two for the sake of time tonight. And then we will pray. Just two. One of them is territories. 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 The places where we come from. The Bible tells us in the book of, I think, Mark chapter 8 verse 22. That Jesus was in Bethsaida. And they brought a blind man to him. And Jesus held the hand of the blind man, sir, and took the man out of the village before healing the man. That means as long as the man is within that territory, Jesus, the son of the living God, was limited in his ability to walk near. I don't know how far the other village was. Jesus held the hand of the man and started following me. And the moment they cross a boundary, he said, the forces, fire. The forces can no longer come here. That means there are possibilities that many coming for, from certain territories produce in the life of people. You don't need to commit any sin. You don't need to violate any law. The fact that you came from a particular place already implicated you. There is no city, no village, no hamlet that the first inhabitant did not enter a covenant with spirit before staying. Ah. Just coming from a territory, you are blasting in tongues and a particular village is pulling you. You are blasting in tongues, setting people free and a particular force is stopping you. I'm not talking about ancestry yet. I will talk about that later. Just a territory alone. There are possibilities that coming from various producers. There are possibilities. When you study, I've, I've, I've studied about Nigeria a little. When you look at the middle belt, you will discover a similarity in the demons that operate in those regions. Their predicaments are similar. Their dimensions of witchcraft are similar. Their limitations are similar. It's not necessarily what the people did. There is something programmed into that territory. You didn't choose to come from there. But that you didn't choose to come from there does not exonerate you from the impact. 
haven't you noticed that there are nations and cities in scriptures anytime God is declaring judgment on them I'm wondering what did they do what exactly did they do I gave you three examples Nineveh what was Nineveh's offense when you read the book of Jonah the Bible never told us what Nineveh did he just said Jonah stand up and go and cry against Nineveh isn't it and when God changed his mind from destroying Nineveh Jonah was angry why was Jonah angry there was something Jonah knew about Nineveh that qualified them for destruction that their repentance averted Jonah was a prophet and his assignment was to speak the counsel of God so when he saw God changing his mind he said no based on what I've seen in the realm of the spirit this city does not desire to qualify to, be, to stay alive but the king and his men exempted themselves from the judgment it looked like God did not destroy Nineveh but when you read the book of Nahum and you read the book of Zephaniah the judgment still happened what was Nineveh's offense? how about Canaan? the land of Canaan that God said Israel should wipe out everybody they should not leave anybody alive why will God say they should destroy Canaan? what did Canaan do? idolatry are they the only ones that did idolatry Israel did idolatry why did he say that they should wipe them so it's not about what the Canaanites did there is a long story how about Babylon even till generation Babylon and revelation Babylon was still being punished Genesis chapter 10 the way you are looking at me is like Pastor Alpha has come from somewhere. Genesis chapter 10. Ah! I was saying something about the generation of Abraham, right? Uh, Noah, isn't it? I said Noah and his sons, he, their wives and his wife, isn't it? Were the only eight people that were spared from the flood. But there is a story that you need to read between the lines to see. Amen. Ham, the son of Noah, was already interacting with those spirits. He didn't buy into their ideologies. He didn't participate in what they were doing. But their mindset and their ideologies were being sold to him. So, Ham was able to preserve their ideology from the pre-flood era to the post-flood era. So, Ham preserved it. And then it was based on this ideology. Ham did something to his father that the Bible calls seeing the father's nakedness. If you understand the speakings of scripture, you will know that it's not grammar, Latin, Greek, and all that. It is deeper than that. Because Leviticus chapter 20 verse 11 tells us that a man who sleeps with his father's wife uncovered the nakedness of his father. So it is not just about the clothes being off. There are things that happen, and the product of that thing that happened is called Canaan. So Noah woke up and said, Cast the Canaan. Cast the Canaan. Servant of servants will he be. So Satan saw that Canaan has been cursed. I need to still preserve this. And then he went after the firstborn of Ham called Cush. And the Bible says that Cush gave birth to four sons. The Bible listed their names in verse 8. Verse 8. Go back to verse 7. And the sons of Cush, Siba, Havila, Sabta, and Rama, and Sabteca. And the sons of Rama are this and that. When the Bible says the sons of these persons are this, that means at that time these are all the sons. Amen. But it didn't end there because none of these carried that ideology that Ham sustained. So there was a need to find another person. So Ham had to give birth again. Or Cush had to give birth again. The next verse says, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Isn't it? The next verse. He was a mighty hunter against the Lord. The word before there is against. He was a mighty hunter against the Lord. Wherefore it is said, he became a reference point. 
as Nimrod, the mighty hunter against the Lord. So Nimrod became a standard for measuring rebellion and wickedness. So you are not rebellious enough until you are rebellious as Nimrod. The mighty hunter against the Lord. So there was a preservation of the spirit of the Nephilim now finding expression in Nimrod. And then we saw the things, I will come back here. We saw the things that were happening in the life of Nimrod, the rebellion he led that was unsuccessful. So it's like Satan kept quiet for a while and he was watching. He saw that Shem began to give birth to a point that Shem had a great grandson called Terah. Terah had a son called Abraham and he saw God entering a covenant with Abraham. And that covenant by the understanding of Satan is that there is a seed coming from here because there is a prophecy in Genesis that the seed of the woman shall bruise his head. And he has been on the search. And for the first time he heard God mentioning seed. Leave your father's house to a land I will give you and to your seed after you. So Satan said, could this be the seed that God was talking about and he began to follow that genealogy to see what he can do and suddenly the bible says rebecca was pregnant ah, rebecca was pregnant and then there was trouble within her womb and she said why am i like this and the lord said within your womb are two boys and these two boys are not just boys they are two nations they are already fighting because of the agenda of darkness against the christ the first bond fighting against the second bond. The second bond fighting against the first bond. But by my ordination, the older shall serve the younger. And then we saw how that he said, Esau have I hated, Jacob have I loved. And I was disturbed for a very long time. Why will God hate a young man that was not born? Should I tell you why? Because the spirit of Nimrod was still hovering. The Bible says that they were born and the boys grew up and Esau became a hunter. Because when you read Genesis 47, when the sons of Jacob came before Pharaoh and Pharaoh asked them their occupation, they said, we and our fathers have been shepherds. Amen. Because they are the generation that should bring forth the Christ, the good shepherd. So that means their occupation must align with that. From who did Esau learn to be a hunter? It was the Antichrist spirit that was already in Nimrod. And when God saw what Satan was going to do, he said, if I allow Esau to carry the blessing, it means I am putting the Christ in an Antichrist system. Now, Nimrod was not a direct father of Esau, but somehow, because they were cousins, it still found expression. So, when you go back to Genesis chapter 10, verse 10, and the beginning, that's talking about Nimrod now. I was talking about Terry preceding it. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So, Babel did not start in chapter 11. There was already a city that Nimrod had built. It was the tower that God confused. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalne in the land of Shinar. In the land of Shinar. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 2. Let me tell you where the land of Shinar is. In the land of Shinar. And the Lord gave Joachim, king of Judah, into his hand as Nebuchadnezzar with part of vessels of the house of God which he carried into the land of who carried them Nebuchadnezzar into a land that has been there long before that time so because the land of Shinar and the kingdom within it were built by Nimrod in rebellion against God there is nothing they will ever do that will exempt them from the punishment of God because the foundation was built on rebellion so it is not a question of whether babylonians hate israel or not they will have to die no matter how good they are 
the blood of Jesus can only save the people, but the land had to perish. Because as far as God is concerned, the land stands before God as a rebellious antichrist system that must be destroyed. Why? Because of the man that built it. Next verse in Genesis 10 now. When you go to verse 11 where they projected for us, the Bible says that he went into the land of Assyria. That Asher then means Assyria. And there he built what? Who built Nineveh? So why did God say Nineveh should be destroyed? So what did the people of Nineveh? You see why the people at the time of Jonah were able to exempt themselves. They fasted and told God we have no part in this thing. So we should not suffer from the things our fathers did. And God said, these guys are sincere. I will still destroy this place. But let me exempt this generation. Nineveh. When you go down, you will see Canaan. And the inhabitants of the place that Canaan built. So just by the way Canaan came, made him an enemy of God. Did you notice that the judgment of God upon Canaan was the exact judgment that the flood did in the days of Noah. Destroy everybody. Why will God destroy everybody and will not say if you find a righteous person there? Destroy everybody. Because within this territory that originated from Canaan is Sodom and Gomorrah. All of these territories that God said they should destroy them completely, they were territories born based on this antichrist system of rebellion and God said no way there is no provision for repentance for them in the same way we come from many territories in this country built upon ancient traditions and altars that are speaking against us the majority of the people are Christians but the altars are still there you are doing the best you can but there is a level you cannot go beyond so territories are mysteries that can produce realities in the lives of people. The second aspect I want to talk about is what I call the mystery of tribes and ancestry. Tribes! Tribes are a very serious mystery in the realm of the spirit. Because while territories can be under the influence of certain covenants, there are individuals also that enter certain covenants. For example, Nimrod himself is an altar for everybody that came through his life. For example, Canaan himself already produced possibilities for everybody that came through his life. I use some classical examples. Look at Moses. What stopped Moses from entering Canaan? The Bible says that God told Moses to speak to the rock. And Moses in anger because of the murmuring of the people struck the rock. Isn't it? And God said, you have not sanctified me before the people. Look at the land, but you will not enter it. Just anger? No! It's not just anger. Because when you read Exodus chapter 2 and verse 2, the Bible says, A man of the house of Levi took a woman of the house of Levi, and the woman conceived and gave birth to a son. That was how the story of Moses began, isn't it? That means the father and the mother of Moses were Levites. <laughs> Go to Genesis chapter 49. Let's read verse 1. Your Moses, a man that spent days in the presence of God. 40 days, first time. 40 days, the second time. Stood before the burning bush. Did all manner of things. Is the man I'm talking about. And Jacob called on to his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Did he say, Gather yourself and your descendants? Did he say, My sons, come with your wives, your families, let me tell them what will happen? He said, I'm going to be speaking to you as individuals. And then they came, verse 2. Gather yourselves together and hear. Ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. Israel was the carrier of the covenant. Remember that the name Israel was given to him after he encountered God. So Jacob used that name as an invocation of his office as the current bearer of the Abrahamic covenant. In other words, what I'm about to say will not fall to the ground. 
verse 5. Read. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. Next verse. All my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor, be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Next verse, read it as loud as you can. Cast! Hold on! What stopped Moses from entering Canaan? What did they say here? This was before they entered Egypt. So, before Moses was born, there was already a curse. I hope you know that the father of Moses was not the direct son of Jacob, was not even the direct son of Levi. They might even have forgotten this thing. I hope you know it was Moses himself that wrote this. <laughs> Cursed be their anger. Cursed is the opposite of blessed. To bless means to empower to succeed. To curse means to empower to fail. Empowered to bring failure be their anger. And then Jacob said it and left it there. And yes, past they were giving birth. His encounter with the burning bush removed let trusty boy didn't remove this cause. He's dwelling in the presence of God for 40 days to a point that his face was glowing, did not remove this cause. His encounter with God the second time did not remove this cause. His seeing the back of God did not remove this cause. He was going to the presence of God with the cause and coming out of the presence of God with the cause. Satan was not threatened by his encounters because there was something he had studied. This guy can be following God. This guy can do miracles in Egypt. But one day, because Satan followed Moses, the first time he tried to destroy Moses was through Pharaoh. It didn't work. So he said, okay, let me study. And he was studying for 40 years. Until one day he saw that Moses in anger killed an Egyptian. He said, Kai, this anger is not ordinary. And he began to study and he saw that there was something Jacob placed upon the anger of his ancestors. And he said, let me explore this. He did it the first time when they served the golden calf. He was angry and he broke the commandment. God did not kill him. He said, okay, let's still watch. He was angry. He grinded the golden calf and gave Israel to drink. Satan said, we are getting close. Until he came to that point. Moses is the man I'm talking about. Moses. Moses. Your Moses, the Lord giver. The one who wrote this. Is the man I'm talking about. There's no time. But let's talk about another person. His name is David. 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 You think that the adultery that David committed was his love for women? No. David was not a product of a legitimate birth. He said it in Psalm 51. He said, I was shepherd in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. It was because of the story surrounding his birth that Jesse did not consider him qualified. Because according to the law of Moses, Anybody that is born out of a relationship that is not legally marital is considered a bastard. And the Bible says a bastard shall not come into the congregation of the Lord. Even up to his tenth generation shall he not come. So when Samuel came and said, bring your sons, Jesse brought the ones that were legally born and left the one that was illegally born. So, David was loving God. Killing Goliath, singing psalms. Yet this thing was there. It was not afraid of his worship. It was not afraid of his singing to God. It was still there, following him. Until the day we saw it happen. That was not the first time David started liking a man's wife. Bathsheba was not the first married woman that David was eyeing. The Bible says when Nabal died, David went and married Abigail. At what point did David start nothing desire for Abigail? Did David about that? 
It just happened that at that time, he didn't have a supreme power that he can kill and do anything. There was a curse. When you study the family of David, you will see that there are marital messes that were there. Joab, Abishai, and Asahel, the members of David's army, were the sons of David's elder sister, Zeruiah. It is in the character of scripture to name people by their father and recognize their mother's name. But when you read through your Bible, you never see anywhere that the name of the fathers of these boys were called. You always see Joab, Abishai, Asahel, the sons of Zeruiah, a woman. Is it that possible that they have different fathers or the name of their father was not known? David's elder sister, Abigail, he was, she was the mother of Amasa. And the Bible says his father's name was, I think, Ethan also. Not her husband is this. If the man was her husband, the Bible will tell us. Isn't it? Because there was something running in that tribe. Judah gave birth to three sons. The first one was wicked before God, God killed him. The second was wicked before God, God killed him. The third one was going and Judah refused to give to Tamar to marry. And then the Bible says that Tamar disguised herself as a harlot. And then Judah slept with her. Number one, Judah patronizes harlots. And Judah was the ancestor of David. <laughs> so it is normal for Judah to visit harlots. So one day he saw a harlot. And it so happened that he didn't have money to pay cash. So he gave the harlot his scepter, the symbol of his authority, gave to the harlot. And then after some days, he sent his friend to go and deliver the prize. And the friend came there and didn't find the harlot. The Bible says after some time, Tamar became pregnant. And according to the law, she should be stoned because she had committed adultery. And then she brought out the scepter and said, the owner of this authority is responsible. So Judah got his son's wife pregnant. Judah's sister Diana was raped. David's daughter Tamar, because there was two anointings, if I may call it, two causes speaking, there was the cause of womanizing and the cause of rape. So Amnon took the father's dimension and Tamar fell victim of the mother's dimension. Nothing just happened. No. Your David, I'm using these examples carefully because these are men that represent a strange dimension in God. If they were not exempted, there must be something you must know that will free you. There must be something you must know. No. Men don't just assess freedom just by desire. There is something you must know. So territories can bring somebody under an influence. Tribes can bring someone under an influence. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. So my question is this. Has God left us without hope? No. He hasn't. There is a bailout plan. There is a bailout plan. There is a bailout plan. Before I talk about the bailout plan, let me show us what Satan does with this information to destroy us. Remember the life of Job. Satan came to God and said, there is something else to give me permission. The question is this, where was that conversation happening? Because Satan has been driven from heaven, right? He has been driven from the presence of God. So at what point was he meeting with God to do this conversation? If Satan was not qualified to come to the presence of God, to the house of God, where is he meeting God? Let me tell you where he's meeting God. He's meeting God in court. Where is he meeting God? In court. My father can disown me, right? My father is the judge. That he disowned me as being a member of the family does not mean I cannot come to the court where he's a judge. The court is an institution that grants everybody access to present his case. 
So Satan has a right to come to the court of God. And Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 tells us that the accuser of the brethren has been cast down. What does he do? He accuses our brethren day. That means that as we are sitting here, there are reports going on in heaven. Who is bringing the report? Satan. What are the reports? This guy is from this territory. And based on the record, these are the things written about that territory. So, and because of this, he cannot progress. See where our, father, our fathers missed it. Now our fathers were born in these circumstances. Either territorial cause or ancestral cause. And then they met the missionaries who preached the gospel to them. And they told them, give your life to Christ and be saved. And they innocently gave their life to Christ. And they were saved. But they didn't understand the difference between prophetic realities and the experience of it. Amen. I usually give this example. Maybe my father is late. Let's assume that my father left me a portion of land and then gave me the documents of that land. My possessing those documents, sir, does not mean that somebody cannot wake up one day and say it's his land. I can be passing one day and see them pouring sand and molding blocks. And I will talk and the person will say, this land belongs to me. You try me, I kill you. The papers have not disappeared. That I have the paper does not mean I will go there and say, look at the paper, get out of my land. They will kill me and take the paper. What do I do? I take the paper to a court of competent jurisdiction and tell them that somebody is trespassing my land and the court will summon the person and ask the person to present his evidence that this land belongs to him. So the court will weigh both evidences and the court will say, based on the evidences before us, I, Meshach Alpha owns this land. Now, the court will now empower what they call the law enforcement agent. So that any time the man is found on the land again, I am not the one that will chase him. There is an authority and a power that will chase him out. So we gave our lives to Christ, got the certificates of birth, got the evidence of our inheritance. Yet Satan is still moving in our land. And all we are doing is get out, get out, get out, get out. You think he will go? Do you think he will go? No. It is only a court process that will give you the justice. It is only a court process. So he accuses us before God day and night. But verse 11, there is something that gave them victory. He said they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimonies. For the Lord not their life, even unto death. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the words of our testimonies. I know you know this scripture. I know you have preached it, but please let me finish. Amen. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. What exactly happened? What is John saying? What did John see? Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. Revelation 5 and verse 9. Please help me with the Amplified. The Amplified. And now they sing a new song. Who are the day? The elders. Remember that John was weeping that there was none in heaven or on earth that could take the book or losing the seals thereof. Isn't it? And then one of the 24 elders came to John and said, Weep no more, for the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And the moment the elder said that, they began to sing. What was the song? And now they sing a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to break the seals that are on it, for you were slain, sacrificed. Remember I said that an altar is an altar because of the presence of a sacrifice. And then the value of the sacrifice upon the altar determines the strength of the voice of that altar. So if an altar is erected against me, you need a sacrifice higher than the one that was used to invoke that altar to undo that. Amen. So there are altars upon territories. There are altars upon families. And these altars were built on sacrifices. But here is another sacrifice. The validity of a sacrifice is the age of the sacrifice. Now, but this sacrifice here is God himself, ageless. 
And with your blood, you did something. You bought. So his blood was a business to You purchased men unto God from where? From where? From Igala, Yoruba, Ibo, Hausa. So the blood of Jesus did not just deliver us from Satan. The Bible says he purchased men from tribes. From tribes. From tribes. From tribes. From tribes. The possibilities of your bad people should not have influence on you. There was a payment paid to that tribe. There was a demand by the tribe. And the blood paid. So if the tribe is still asking for the payment, you can go to court. How can I pay you for land and you still tell me the land belongs to you? Don't shout yet because this is your reality. Yet you go through the trouble. <laughs> Purchase men to God from every, every, and look at now, and language, and people, and nation. Nation talks about territory. So this is what the blood of Jesus did. He purchased men. So this is the blood. I know this, you know this. Yet there is still battle. So the question is this. If this is true, why have I not seen the reality of this in my life? Because like I said before, somebody is illegally claiming my property. The tribes have been paid, but they still said I belong to them. The language has been paid. They are still saying I belong to them. The people have been paid. They are still saying I belong to them. The nations have been paid in full. They are still saying I belong to them. So that means I should go to court. But the challenge is this. There is a standard process in the court of God. You can't just walk to God anyhow. There are accredited people. First John chapter 5. We'll round up there. First John chapter 5. What I'm giving you tonight is spiritual intelligence. We will stand up and claim our inheritance. Chase the devil out of our lives, out of our inheritance, out of our families, out of everything that belongs to us. Enough of this nonsense. First John chapter 5 verse 7. You can only imagine the kind of family I came from. Nothing works in that family. And I told myself, I either walk on this or remain unmarried because I can't bring another person's daughter into this marriage. No way. I won't be that wicked. For there are three that bear record in heaven. Record, record, record. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, who is our judge, our lawgiver, our king, who is our Father, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that these three are one. That means that there are three offices for the same person. Hey. Verse 8. These three are one. Verse 8. And there are three that bear witnesses in the earth. The word in the earth this does not just mean that the witness happens on earth. In the matters of the earth, in the matters of the earth, there are three that bear witnesses in the earth. The Spirit, who is part of the record in heaven, the Spirit, who has all the stories, the fall, the altars, the foundations, the death of Jesus, the price that was paid, the Spirit has the record. So he's part of those that bear record and he's part of those that bear witness. Follow me carefully. The spirit, the water, and the blood. The Bible didn't say these three are one. They are not one. They only agree as one. That means the voice of the spirit is different from the voice of the water. It's different from the voice of the blood. We already know what the blood is saying. The voice of the water is saying in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul said, that he might sanctify her by the washing of water by the word. That means it is the dimension, the sanctifying dimension of the word of God. If it is the sanctifying dimension of the word of God, that means this word does not condemn you. Amen. So the blood bought you, 
the water declares your sanctification, but there must be the agreement of three witnesses before the inheritance can be given to you. Now, my challenge is this. I am the accused. I am the one whose blessings are held down. I am the one who is not getting a job. I am the one who is not getting married. I am the one who is limited. But the Bible didn't mention me as an accredited witness. So, the Bible says there are three accredited witnesses who can appear in court and their witnesses will be accepted. I am not mentioned there. Man is not mentioned there. The spirit, the water, and the blood. What did Jesus tell them in Acts chapter 1 verse 8? But ye shall receive power after that the same spirit who is an accredited witness comes upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me as a man you are not accredited but in partnership with the Holy Spirit the slot of the Holy Spirit becomes your slot so unlike Job who was not present when his matter was being discussed I am not going to be absent when my matter will be discussed if they are discussing my job I am there if they are discussing my progress I am there because in partnership with the Holy Ghost I become an accredited witness why? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 that the Holy Ghost is the seal of our redemption a seal is an authentication so that means the blood purchased redemption the Holy Ghost authenticates redemption you see that the Holy Ghost is a matter of life and death he does not just help you to pray in tongues so that means when there is a summons in the course of heaven there is a cross examination you are praying to move forward. You are making effort to move forward. And then Satan brings his accusation and says, Meshach Alpha cannot go forward. He's saying, This lady cannot get married. The blood is saying, I paid. The water is saying, I sanctified. And then Satan will say, Let me cross examine him. You are talking about what you did for him. But he has to make a confession that must be in sync with what the blood and the waters are saying. Thou judge, give me time to cross-examine him. And Jesus, the advocate, says, objection, my Lord. I don't want this cross-examination to go on. And then the judge says, according to divine justice, cross-examination is allowed. Let the cross-examination go on. I overrule the objection. And he says, Satan, go ahead. Cross-examine Kenny. Cross-examine him. The cross-examination begins with all manner of troubles. Suddenly everybody starts provoking you. Suddenly you enter a business, it fails. Suddenly you hear news from every corner. Everything is hitting you. And the Bible says the attempt is to make Job to sin with his mouth. The attempt was not just for him to lose something. Because if he can say something different from what the blood is saying, he will lose his case in court. And then the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is with me on earth. Jesus, the advocate, is with the Father. Holy Spirit, the advocate, is with me. While Jesus is speaking, the Holy Ghost taps me in the night. He said, don't sleep. Just wake up and begin to pray. So, shaka, take a, 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 take I see I'm tired. He said, no. The case is still going on. Keep praying. One hour, I'm tired. No. Two hours, no. Three hours, no. He said, stop dancing. At this point, what is required is praise. And then you are doing things that don't make sense. Because there is a partnership with the Holy Spirit. Who is present in heaven and is with you on earth. And then you wake up in the morning and good news that he's in you on every side. You are wondering what you did because you were present in God. You were present in court. I made up my mind. I will not be absent when my matter is discussed. How many of you are ready to enter the court tonight? Satan has been the one initiating the court process. He has been the one initiating. He's been the one reporting. Not anymore. I am taking the matter to court. Not anymore. What are you tired about? What has been a response to you? Open your mouth and blast in tongues. We are presenting our church before the church by the Holy Ghost.
For there are three that bear witness. The spirit, the water, and the blood. I've been bought from every tribe. I've been bought from every language. I've been bought from every people. I've been bought from this country. I've been bought from Nigeria. I've been bought from Zaria. I've been bought from Kaduse. I've been bought from Nasarawa State. I've been bought from Denver State. I've been bought from the Chief Nation.
for about two to three minutes. And as you do that, chains will break. As I was preparing yesterday, I was praying. My eyes were closed. And I was seeing the heads of serpents staring at me. I was seeing the heads of serpents. 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 This kind. Is this what you want to tell the people of God? He couldn't stop me from telling you. The head of that serpent must be crushed. There are families hearing my voice right now, whether here, outside or online, that your families have been under the influence of certain serpentine spirits. All that's dedicated and supervised by serpents, just as they can say, that all serpents are cut off. I am born. They are controlling all that. Do you be this place? Let those serpents catch fire. I release the sword of judgment. Let the sword of the Lord destroy those serpents. Let the sword of the Lord destroy those serpents. I'm in your 
Not to attack your inheritance. Not to follow today. Not to follow today. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. I'm taking it. Right now. Shake it to the top. I'm taking my finances. I'm taking my finances. I'm taking my health. for you now. Lift your hands wherever you are and be silent. If the Lord gives the word, he gives the power to perform the word. The revelation of Jesus which he God gave him to reveal unto his servant John. He stands and signifies by his angels. As I was teaching the saints were taking their place Moses himself, the one whose case I use as an example, was present here to bear witness to the things I was saying. Because when Moses discovered that there was an influence, he changed the pronouncements upon the tribes. He took an anointed person to place the cause. Moses started to reverse the cause. But at that time, it was too late to benefit for him. He said, even though it has destroyed me, I will not allow it to continue destroying others. So he sat down and began to bless Israel. Moses is here to bear witness. I'm about to pray for you. Raise your hand and be silent. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I declare any misfortune in the life of anybody under the influence of my voice, inside, outside, overflow one, two, three, online following from across the nations of the earth. I don't care what it is. I don't care the altar that sponsored it. There is a sacrifice on that altar that gave it a voice. But there is another sacrifice upon another altar. The Bible says that every testament is dedicated by a shedding of blood. The will of a man is effected after the death of the man. Our evidence is that Jesus died. And because Jesus died, his will can be performed. His will is prosperity. His will is divine health. His will is breakthrough. His will is advancement. I declare in the name of Jesus, any person whose life is opposite of the will for which Jesus died, by the power of the Holy Ghost, I command those altars, God fire now. Because of certain altars, I invoke the voice of the blood. Shakenko Katakata, Lambato Sekata. Every sickness in your body, cancer, arthritis, diabetes, whatever your name is, that is in the body of God's people, I reason of ancestors, I cast you in the name of the God of heaven. I command you to live out of your body now. In the name of Jesus. Beginning from the next three hours. Beginning from the next three hours from now. The good news that you have never seen. I don't mean tomorrow morning. I mean the next three hours from now. The next three hours from now. The next three hours from now, Jateko Kappa, Duka Sekako, Kappa Sekaka. The Lord is telling me that there are several people that it's like your finances are under a Every law apostle has thought you have engaged, 
nothing is happening in the name of the Lord Jesus I break that feet now I break it I break it I break it I congratulate you tonight because you have entered a new season yes you should clap you should clap no more no more no more no more Give God thanks tonight for the great and mighty things He has done. Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you. In the name of Jesus. While we are still standing, remember I said that it's the blood of Jesus that portrays us to God. And the blood has been shed prophetically, but there must be an acceptance that makes it your reality. Whether you are inside, outside, or following online. If you are not born again, what I said may not apply to you. The mercy of God can exempt you for a while, but you can be totally free from the influence of Satan if he becomes the Lord of your life. So right now, be the first to come out. Inside, outside, online. You are not born again. You want to come under the covering of this blood by accepting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Please, I want you to run from where you are, pick your belongings, and run to me in front here. Please celebrate them as they come. Don't allow Satan cheat you. Run from where you are and come under the covering of the blood. Run from where you are. Run from where you are. Run from where you are. It's an escape from darkness. Run. Run. Keep clapping. They are coming. Don't allow friends to stop you. Run from where you are. Keep clapping. Shaka Khan. Yes. Keep clapping. Jesus is calling you. Jesus is calling you. Keep clapping. Keep clapping. They are coming. They are coming. Keep clapping. You are coming out not just for yourself. You are opening the door of breakthrough for your family. Jesus is saying he has been waiting for you. He has been longing to bring breakthrough to your family. But there is no one to represent him. This is why you came here tonight. It might be your first time, but Jesus brought you that he might bring breakthrough to you and to your family. Keep clapping, they are coming. There are several of you that Jesus is calling. Keep coming, they are still coming. Don't allow Satan cheat you. Keep coming. Tonight is the night of salvation. Keep coming. Keep clapping, there are lots of people that are coming. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost fall. I congratulate every one of you that is outside. If you are still coming, you can come and join them very quickly. Lift your right hand and say, I'm coming. You're not reciting the toy. You are entering a possibility. It's an exchange of life. So I want you to say it from the depth of your heart, mean it from your spirit. Lord Jesus, say it, Lord Jesus. Tonight has come to you. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I believe that you died in my place upon the cross. You rose on the third day that I may have life. Tonight, I give you my life and I receive your life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I pray for this one. Your word said, as many as receive you, you give them the power to become sons of God, even to as many that believed in your name. I pray that because they have believed in your name, let the experience of the transition from darkness into light happen in their lives now. Give them an assurance of their salvation. Let the Holy Spirit come upon them as a down payment for their inheritance. In the name of Jesus. Whatever has been a manifestation of ancestry that has been speaking in their lives until now. By reason of this change of ownership, I declare, let those powers be broken. And let a restoration happen instantly. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. 
I congratulate those of you, my friends, and those before all the projectors and across the nations of the earth following us. Please, very quickly, you can follow the young lady waving her hands there, and then she will interact with you, take your details so that we can know you better and pray for you more fervently. Please, you can follow them now. Please celebrate them as they go in the name of Jesus. believe you have been blessed by this message. For additional information, you can visit us on Facebook on www.facebook.com slash Koinonia Parenting Network International. Or follow us on Twitter www.twitter.com slash Koinonia underscore KNI. You can also download our messages on www.foreshared.com. Parenting Network International, the protection of the owners of God's life and earth.